All right, my friends. Robert, you didn't get the message, the memo. Where's your pink shirt? Ah. It's like it's like we're being the opposite of Elizabeth Holmes today, Kelly. I was thinking about that. <laughs> it's like we are the sweet, innocent, ethical, no more black turtlenecks for us. We're in our pink sweaters today. <laughs> yeah. Truly innocent. Truly. <laughs> we're going with that. Um, so, so guys. Good news what? before you start, Robert. What's it's the good on news? My, it's on my news feed, my LinkedIn feed as well. So thank you for I connecting see. with me. Okay. <laughs> I see you. This is very nice. So what that means, you guys. So for those of you who are following Joe, you can now stream the show live from her profile as well as mine. And we have a few people coming in. Hey, Shri. And Heather, good to see you, my friend. And this uh, this is Stephanie. Stephanie, what's going on? Stephanie, you just got a new job, didn't you? I think you got a new job. If so, congratulations, my friend. You guys, we are on episode number 37 of the Friday Froster, and we title this one, Blood is Thicker Than Fraud. <laughs> so... For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, I'm going to give you a backstory because this one is a fun one for me because you guys know that the person we're talking about today is the person that I call my favorite villain. And boy, is Villainess. She. Villainess. There you go. Mm -hmm. So today we're talking about Elizabeth Holmes. Now, if you don't know who she is, she founded a company called Theranos where they <clears throat> invented, and I'm saying invented in air quotes, <laughs> a device that would take a small amount of blood and run multiple blood tests. Now, supposedly this, fight, this device would do it cheaper than current mechanisms and using a lot less blood, and it was supposed to be more accurate than our current blood test. Now, her company, at one point in time, was valued at over $50 billion that's with a B, my friends, not with an M, $50 billion. Now, Holmes was applauded as being one of the youngest female billionaires. Unfortunately, the product didn't work. I mean, it would be nice if it worked, right? But <laughs> unfortunately, the product didn't work. And it is alleged that she duped investors. It's also alleged that she had fake trade shows and essentially struck deals with some pretty big uh, uh, companies all for a product that did not work. Now, we've talked about her a few times on the show. And last year, she was supposed to go to trial and she got it delayed because of COVID. And then Kelly introduced us to a nice uh, term and concept when the trial was delayed again. She uh so she had a boyfriend at one point in time who helped her in the company. She and that boyfriend broke up and she got a new boyfriend very quickly. And she ended up getting pregnant by that new boyfriend. And Kelly, what is it called? Plead the belly. Plead the belly. Now, can you tell us what in the world is pleading the belly, Kelly? What is that? It's so they get a, you know, it's kind of <laughs> in, in the old days, it was that, you know, they had a baby and people would feel sympathy and empathy for them. And therefore it would be delayed, potentially even, you know, an execution would be delayed. Well, we don't do that, but, um, you know, the trial did get delayed because she was popping the belly. So, yeah. Ah. Crazy. I want to talk about the, because Sri said she planned it out. So I know we're going to get there because of what the three of us talked about this morning. I want to talk about this new family that she has. Um, and I am just appalled a little bit with something that happened during the trial that I hadn't heard about. So I'm going <laughs> to see if you guys had heard it. Yeah. Ooh. So, yeah. Well, let's just dig right into it because so now the trial was delayed all of last year and finally we had the trial and they just wrapped up closing arguments. Uh, I think it was Wednesday, I believe. So, Joe, what happened? Well, I just let's go back to the beginning of the trial. So okay. um, I just I just 
you know, talking about the belly defense or pleading the belly, as Kelly called it, you know, all of a sudden she had this kind of new family. Um, so they're calling him her partner. Um, did they get married, Kelly? I can't remember. They no, did get I don't think so. Okay. So they're not, they didn't get married. Okay. I couldn't remember that part, uh, but obviously she had this baby. Um, so Kelly and I listened to Bad Blood, the final chapter, which is John Kerry Rue's kind of extension of the book. And he's got public episodes that you guys can go listen to uh, that are really great facts. But then he's also following the trial. And Kelly's going to give you another great resource to follow that followed the trial. Um, but in one of the very early episodes that you have to kind of pay to subscribe for about the trial, one of the reporters who he also does this podcast with who's following the trial said there was a guy who is saying he was a reporter and he said his name was Hanson. And he was kind of very weird about answering questions. He was overly friendly. He offered to borrow people to borrow his coat because I guess it was really cold in the courtroom. And John Kerry Rue even said, I borrowed the guy's coat. Well, it turns out this is Elizabeth Holmes' partner. Uh, their last name is Evans. I think it's like Williams Evan, William Evans Jr. or something, senior, junior. Billy um, Evans. Billy Evans, yep. It was his dad. So this is Elizabeth Holmes, new baby's grandfather, who snuck his way into court by pretending he was a reporter named Hanson. And, you know, I love that the reporter said, it's like made for TV. It doesn't get any better than this. You cannot make this stuff up. And I say that a lot in ethics training. I'm like, these are real stories. And that I'm using as examples, you cannot make this stuff up. And I just thought, wow. So doesn't that give you a clue as to who now is in cahoots with her with perhaps this belly defense? Can you imagine what their Thanksgiving dinner was like? Oh my gosh. No, I cannot. <laughs> to be a fly on the wall or on the pumpkin pie. I don't know, but I, I just cannot believe that. I bet they didn't have pumpkin pie. They probably had pumpkin creme brulee or pumpkin like chiffonade or something. These are fancy people. <laughs> I am. I just, when I heard that, I mean, it threw me over the edge from the very beginning of the trial, listening to the trial updates. But yeah. Anyway, okay. Yeah, yeah. So and then, check this out. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Go ahead. Well, and then she got some of her sorority sisters to show up. Mm -hmm. Not all of them showed up, but she got some of her sorority sisters to show up. You know, okay. I think the, big, the biggest thing is humanizing herself, right? They keep talking about that. She yep. wanted to take off her mask and they wouldn't let her. And they thought... You know, really, that that's probably I'm jumping ahead here, Robert, I'm stealing your thunder. But that's probably one of the main reasons she got put on the stand because they wanted people to see her face and how authentic and genuine they thought she was. So crazy. But OK, Robert, take it away. No, you got it. That's exactly where I was going. Check out how the news is covering the story. Elizabeth Holmes smiles on the stand as her trial nears an end. A Smile. scattered Day in court. Smiles and tears, though, boy, at the end. Mm -hmm. But look now, here's what the story says. I expected more fireworks from a cross-examination of former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes. Instead, today was a disjointed day of questions without a clear narrative through line. I don't know why the government chose to send an assassin who didn't know when to twist the knife. Okay, so now... Here's what they're calling a scattered day. Let's just go down a little further. So they said um, she's facing 11 counts of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. But when we go down here, this is how this reporter summarized this and said it was a scattered day. Now, this doesn't seem like a scattered day to me, but you guys can be the judge. It says today was more scattered. Leah did score some points. Leach, I'm sorry, the uh, prosecuting attorney. But he didn't carry through the narrative thread about Holmes's control. So they were trying to prove that Holmes knew what was happening and that she was in control of the company. Here's a brief overview of the cross-examination. Holmes admitted that Theranos devices weren't made, weren't on medevac helicopters, as several investors claims Holmes told them. So let me tell you what that is. 
several investors are saying that she told them that the military were using the devices. Now, she said on the stand that she didn't recall saying that to any investors. Now, for those of you who are fraud investigators or internal auditors, we do this thing called observation and inquiry, but we also do corroboration. So several investors said that she told them that. She got on the stand and said she doesn't remember saying it. So who are we going to believe? Three, four, five investors or one person who we know lied about other things? Now, she also said Holmes knew it would be wrong to tell an investor Theranos didn't use third party machines. So now here's what happened here. They did use third party machines because their machines didn't work. So they were trying to prove a point to say, did she know that it was wrong to say we didn't use third party machines when they did? So she knew that that was wrong. So now they all they have to do is prove that she said it to at least one investor. She also said. She acknowledged that there were several different financial proje projections were given to investors and the people calculating Theranos stock option values. So they gave one set of financial statements to the investors, another set of people that would determine how much the company is actually worth. Uh, so today my house is worth two hundred thousand dollars. But if I talk to another person, it's worth three. Now, it also says that Holmes knew that there were a bunch of things wrong with a big fortune article, but promoted it anyway. So there were some things that were false in the fortune article. And she said, you know, you should go read my article. But she knew that there were things in it that were wrong. Emails also showed that Theranos did special preparation for demo test and didn't report the results that they were having trouble with. So allegedly they faked some demos. And they tested beforehand and knew that certain things didn't work and they didn't tell anyone. But emails showed that they knew that something was wrong. Now, mind you, there's more, but I'm going to stop in a, in a second. But this is what a reporter is calling scattered. All of these admissions are scattered. All right, Joe Kelly, what, what, what do you guys think? You know, it's... Um... <sighs> I bet the prosecution didn't spend a lot of time thinking that she'd show up and testify. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a mistake. It's called, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, war gaming it. I don't know. I don't think they probably, they're like, Oh, well, you know, what are the chances it? And then this is another thing I had just off the top of my head is like, why did they have a male cross her? Maybe they should have had a female cross her. I wonder if they thought about that. Oh. I just well, they they, you, they certainly thought about it when it came to the jury selection. Um, so yeah. I'm imagining that that was discussed among the prosecution. But I mean, I don't know. But what yeah. Kelly? I guess elaborate on like what difference because I heard about the jury selection. You know, she was very kind of uh, charismatic with males, obviously, and influenced males a little easier. So, for those of you that don't know, there was originally seven males and five females selected for the jury. Um, but they also said women, you know, are more critical of women. So, you know, it could have it kind of seemed maybe like the that. Um, I don't know that they were kind of picking on her more if they right. had a woman doing it because of that. So that might might be why they went with a male. I don't know. I just was really interested in the psychology of that when they were talking about jury selection. Well, and maybe they thought that like Elizabeth would try to charm him and they would have said, see, or, you know, would have inferred like, look at she charms the men. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I'm sure they thought about it. But it's just, it's it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, and, and um, there's a there's a Washington Post opinion piece, and I cannot find it for the life of me, talking about the villainesses of Jelaine Maxwell, of Jeffrey Epstein, and Elizabeth Holmes. Yep. Um, you know, we've talked about this before. If it weren't for the medical, this is just another WeWork. It's much less than a WeWork. I mean, WeWork was a lot more money. Yeah, actually, um, I love that Pozo brought up WeWork, and that's what I was thinking yep. about. The name of that documentary and book club that Kelly and I did on WeWork was Unicorn or Fraud. 
And, you know, when you think about Elizabeth Holmes, like she was this unicorn. Um, and I, I think that so many people put her up on that pedestal, you know, in that unicorn with that valuation. You know, it is so similar to the WeWork scenario. Um, hmm. but, you know, I still think, you know, I still think that the prosecution did a good job. Ultimately, I, I really do. Um, and I think that um, while I was really bummed that the people who got false health reports couldn't, they couldn't, here's the deal, they could talk about what happened, what the results were they got, but they couldn't talk about how it made them feel. So they couldn't right. bring in your emotions to it, which I thought was just horrible at first. Cause I was like, what, what good is it going to do? But then when I did hear the patients and then the doc, their doctors that came on the stand, like, I do think that was a really meaningful part of the trial. So I'm, I'm just hoping things like that stick. Yeah. 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 So now let me just go back a little bit. Are you guys saying that she was treated a little differently because she was a woman? <laughs> As a as a business owner or, or as on trial? <laughs> oh, on trial, on trial. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I honestly, I don't know. I think that, you know, I think that where it got to at the very end, humanizing her, and then we got to that Svengali defense, which I think we've talked about on here before, is that her defense is that she was physically and emotionally, you know, mentally abused in order to lie and essentially commit these frauds. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, she, she's using that as a female. I think that a male couldn't use that defense nearly as well as Elizabeth did. Um, and I just, I just keep hoping the prosecution stepped to the facts and I just, I hope those facts went out over the emotion. I mean, we're auditors. That's what we hope, right? I mean, at the end of the day that facts speak the truth. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, the very end of the trial, all the emotions got brought in. So. Yeah. Well, and that's what I'm hoping, too, because a lot of our news outlets are still doing a horrible job with this as well. Because if you look here, it says if there was a theme, it was Holmes didn't recall a lot of events. But given how the defense delayed the trial, that seems possible after all. A lot of this was more than five years ago, and some of the testimony concerned things from 10 years ago. It's easier to say I don't recall about events that happened 10 years ago than it is to say about something that happened yesterday. Well, so I'm going to put in um, this in the chat. Dora Dorothy Atkins is um, just tweeting like mad right now. Um, because the judge is giving instructions and um, yeah, so. Uh, and, and just so you guys know, right, it's going to be like what the 16th, 17th is going to be closing statements and they expect a verdict by like the 20th. So like Chris, mm -hmm. Christmas, like Kelly said, Christmas, are we going to know by Christmas? And I know everybody's hoping that there's no more delays that go into the new year, but I think there still are a few motions on the table that will be interesting to see if this really happens in the next week. So I was so excited that we were talking about it because I think, you know, right over the new year, we can give an update, hopefully, on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's just, it's so fascinating because I don't think anyone, like, you know, there was a big case that just happened recent, two big cases that happened recently, totally different, you know, cases but people had a really strong opinion as to how they were going to go what uh, which side i don't think anyone has a strong opinion on this like i i think it's like a coin toss practically i do too i totally think it's in the hands of those jurors and you know i found it very interesting um you know some of the the jury process you know how some of them have you know had anxiety one of them got uh, one of them got caught playing Sudoku and not paying attention and they let her go. You know, I mean, it's been really interesting. And I'm sure this happens in a lot of trials. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I was glad that it made it this far because they were worried about because of COVID, because of how high you know profile this case is, that it, it was going to go into mistrial because they were using so many alternate jurors. So, you know, at this point, I think 
I'm just thankful it kept going. Um, I have no idea how it's going to play out either. Um, and I, I agree with Kelly. It could go very much could go either way. I, you know, I want, can I bring up one other point that I feel like I didn't realize was going to be brought up so much at trial, which is very related to another high profile kind of um, scam or fraud that's happened lately that not very many people talked about a lot. Um, is this falsifying and using the Pfizer logo on material? Okay, so this was a huge oh. part of the prosecution was that she and, and she admitted towards the end of the trial when she was on stand on the stand that she is the one who did it, who put the Pfizer logo on, you know, who falsified that they had approved, you know, or whatever their their device. And, you know, I think this was a bigger point than people are making it. Um, it is. Because, you know, this does show intent. It does show like fraud to me. Um, and for some reason, my mind went to the Aussie media thing. Do you guys remember? So the COO of Aussie Media, who faked being the CEO of YouTube on an investor call. Yes, yes. And, you know, and I just, you know, I know it's a completely different thing, but I, I was appalled by that, and I feel like, you know, we, we just have as a society and as media and legal, you know, law, laws like. Why can we not? Like Hal said, a lie is a lie is a lie. You know, this is falsifying documents. This is impersonating humans. You know, when is this behavior going to stop? Like, I just, I, I don't know. This whole, that whole thing really just got me with the trial. And I, I really hope, you know, the, the bad thing is the jurors know nothing or very little about this. You know, they have not read the book. They have not seen the documentaries. Of course, they wanted people who had, who had no knowledge. But, you know, I just, um, I think we, we all want her to be guilty so bad. I kind of wish I was somebody who knew nothing and could come in and see how I felt at the end of the day. Yeah. So I, right. anyway. So so for those who, who missed some of that, let's just go back a little bit. So okay. she, uh, on some of their equipment, she put uh, basically a seal saying approved by the FDA. Uh, yeah, the FDA. And they were not approved. That is a crime. You cannot do that. And she actually admitted to it on the stand. Now, there were a whole bunch of other things that she either couldn't remember or blame the boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend about. But this one thing she actually admitted to, which if she admitted to that, then what else did she knowingly and willingly do? Because she's trying to say that somebody else is at fault for everything else. Well, and they said, you know, because this isn't the FDA that's bringing her to trial, this is the right. investors that are bringing her to trial, that really that FDA thing doesn't even come into play. You know, and in fact, they had to, I think they even had to throw out a piece of that information. So really, it was the Pfizer logo and maybe another company logo that they used to present their book to, to investors to say, you know, that's the piece that they could do. I, mean, I think everybody was appalled that they were saying FDA did stuff that they didn't. But it's not the FDA that's suing or that, you know, that's uh, bringing her to court over this. It's the individual investors. Yeah, I think the importance of it, though, is it shows that she she knowingly did something that was wrong that was extremely significant because yeah. if you look at everything else she's blaming the boyfriend let's see we can start to really look at some of the things that she started to blame him for so even in this article it says a key aspect of the defense has been shifting blame to balwini uh she claims that he physically abused, physically, emotionally and sexually abused her. Uh, he denies the allegations. Now, earlier in her testimony, she told the jury, uh, home sold the jury that she decided to devote her life to starting Theranos after she was sexually assaulted. They use a different word, sexually assaulted while a student, while a student at Stanford University. Uh, the government said that it plans to file a motion to strike part of Holmes's testimony, including her allegation of sexual assault while at Stanford. Uh, Leach, an assistant U.S. attorney, told the judge that the testimony was irrelevant to the case at hand since the defense chose not to call a psychologist as a witness to testify to her mindset. But then when they started asking her questions, 
they were very direct. They asked her if uh, Balwini criticized employees at Theranos as being incompetent. She said he did. They went on to ask her several other questions, and she would say he showed up at the church I would go to at night and at the dish, which is where she used to hang out when she worked at uh, when she was at, in school at Stanford. Uh, the places I would go outside of work, he would be there is what she was saying. Now, Downey ended his questioning by asking Holmes about a key allegation against her, whatever she intended, uh, whether she intended to mislead investors. And she said never. Downey asked if she acknowledges that investors lost money. She said, I do. Was that the result of you attempting to mislead them? Her attorney asked. And she said, of course not. But in her last words to the jury, Holmes restated her original vision for Theranos. I wanted to change the impact the company could make for people and for healthcare. Holmes said there were people that were long term investors. And I wanted to talk about what this company could do a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Now, the reason that I think this is important is if you look at everything she's saying, I believed in this company. I filed patents for this company. Just because you filed a patent doesn't mean that what you filed a patent for actually worked. Just because you believe in a company doesn't mean it should be worth billions of dollars. So even if you look at what she's saying, I believed in this company. Not once did she say our product worked and it worked well. Mm -hmm. She's saying, I believe you don't get to a billion dollars based on beliefs. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that was interesting that came out in the jury selection as well, Robert, to your point, is that they didn't want anybody on the jury from Silicon Valley because they would sympathize with her mentality of fake it till you make it. And, you know, kind of this whole belief in my product would have um, kind of overshadowed uh, and maybe helped her case. And so I think that goes to your point um, there. Um Hal's question, Tyler did not take the stand. As far as I know, Erica Chung did. So she was the main whistleblower and they brought up Tyler um, during her testimony because one of the sticking points that the defense when they cross-examined Erica was that they asked if she ever directly brought her concerns to Elizabeth. And mm. she said, no, because my friend and colleague Tyler Schultz already had. And so that was her response. Otherwise, they said she did a brilliant job on the stand as the main whistleblower uh, in the case. So it wasn't Tyler. It was Erica. How to answer your question. Yeah. Well, and, you know. Well, here's Pozo saying when you phrase it that way. Did the investors do their due diligence? We talked about this either last week or the week before. Investors doing due diligence. Is it <clears throat> this victim shaming, Kelly? Does this count? I, I mean, just heard, nope. Listening to the, I think it's episode 11, 10 or 11 of Bad Blood. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to go here. A bunch of old dudes who were greedy they were blood the attorney like it's insane they talk about though mattis you know when mattis was put on the stand he only only invested eighty five thousand dollars. but for him as what did he call himself a public servant that was a significant amount of money but he only invested because elizabeth said you know our device is small it can be used in the medevac helicopters right like he was they were yes they, did they do due diligence enough no did they trust they did they trust and not verify kelly yeah the t-shirt <laughs> yeah. well right and basically she you know he only gave eighty five thousand dollars. no one gave that little she wanted him for social capital social yeah. proof and it's really interesting if you listen to the podcast they talk about on those medevac heli helicopters things weigh to the ounce. You don't just put a machine on. The pilots have to agree. Like, I mean, and, and there was a part of one of the podcast episodes was, you know, there was a guy from the military and, you know, everyone lo loves to bash government employees. There was a guy from the military who was like, this is crazy. This isn't going to happen. And he kind of got shut down. 
So mm -hmm. when people are out there saying that government hacks, bull crap. Like there were government hacks that tried to stop her. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. There was, well, there were a lot of people ultimately, and I think that was the list of people that they called to the stand that tried to stop her. And that's what's sad to me in this case is how long it went on um, without people being heard. I mean, there was a scientist, uh, you know, that that took his own life, you know, and that came up in the trial. Ian Gibbons uh, was discussed. And um, I, I mean, so many people tried. And that's that's the sad thing about about these. Um, and let me just answer Hal's question really quick. Tyler Schultz was on the list of witnesses, potential witnesses. So, you know, as was John Kerry Rue, but John Kerry Rue never got subpoenaed. So I don't know if Tyler did enough. So, or did get subpoenaed, sorry. I did hear one interview with her. It was on the record with um, Parloff, the F Forbes or Fortune, I can't remember which reporter. And um, she was asked a question. And her voice is just so different from when she normally spoke. She said, like, he asked her a, a, a yes or no question. And there wasn't a pause, but her voice was different. And I was, remember, I'm driving in my car and I'm like, going, that's that's not right. That's not her. Like, it was fascinating because there wasn't that pause, like, which, how am I going to answer it? But her, I, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but I, I thought no. it was very different than the rest of the taped phone call he had. And and that is on bad, in one of the episodes of Bad Blood, those conversations, right, Kelly? That was one yeah. of the episodes. So, I, I mean, really fascinating. And that was a point um, that they brought up on the Bad Blood podcast was how was her voice in the courtroom when she was on the stand? And they said <laughs> it was that same you know, it was the same lower voice, you know, that she adopted, but it seemed natural. She was very charming on the stand, you guys. And she, um, but she didn't blink. I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. Like, I, I, was, I, was, like she's, I mean, people are amazed that the woman doesn't blink. So I, I just thought that was it. <laughs> well, I think she's faked the voice for so long that it is now a part of, part of her. who yeah. she is. And, and they said, I mean, even with the um, the composure and stuff on the stand and the, the non-blinking, like she just does seem so well practiced. She never says, um, and like, and you know, and, and they seem, made it seem like she did such a great job on the stand. But I'm wondering if there was some question in the juror's mind of this seemed too good. Too polished. I mean, maybe too polished, you know, and so maybe it will work against her. I think. You know, but she did very much have the tears when she needed to, the you know, break out in kind of hives, the wrath, the redness, you know, when she needed to. So it'll be really interesting to see how it goes. Well, and I think here's the issue because um, she looked good on the stand. But if you simply read the news articles, you'll see that the answers that she gave to the questions implicate her fully in a lot of this stuff and to you guys' point um the emotions the prosecution didn't really bring out the emotion and we as people are very emotional again you guys said look at all the people who tried to come forward and they were squashed how many times has that happened to auditors you mm -hmm. know go ahead joe no just i mean on that note though i do want to say what the prosecution is being kind of um, dinged for the most is when they cross-examined Elizabeth, they they weren't sure, like nobody was sure if they would do it, but they um, kind of, uh, how do I put this? Not bashed, but they, they picked on her about the Svengali defense and the abuse defense, which is a very sensitive thing to do. I'm guessing Kelly probably has more or experience with this, but um, because that could backfire on them because they could look like the mean guys, right? The bad guys right. picking on the victim that's been abused, but they actually had her read, read out loud text messages between her and Belwani right. out the, uh, with the I love yous and all that stuff. And so it's really interesting again that, I mean, that's how they ended this. And so, you know, how did we leave that in the jury's mind? Like, oh, 
questioning that abuse thing that they might go down further down in the to the road with or um, in closing arguments, at least. Or did it, um, you know, did it leave a question in their mind or did it make the prosecution look like bullies? I, I don't I don't know. Well. And, and and here's the thing. So so for you guys who don't know what the uh, Svengali defense is, it's basically when people are abused, they. Mm, OK, somebody else explain it because I'm going to sound real bad and people are going to bash me if I say, say my thoughts on it. I mean, it's a good defense. I mean, meant for people that when used appropriately. Yes, yeah, exactly. but people abuse it. Well, and I think that to me, there is just so many facts and evidence that she was fully in charge of the company. Like he was not running every little bit, you know, and, and just the evidence of the meetings where he would defer to her to make a decision. Like there, right. those are things that, that, that were brought up that I hope that that really negated that defense before it even came up because that didn't come up till the very end of the trial. So, yeah. So yeah. so I'll go ahead and say it. The Bengali defense is basically when someone says that they were abused and they were essentially coerced into doing something that was wrong. It is a very good defense. However, in modern times, it's been abused and overused in for when people have just wanted to get off. You know, the Boston people, bombers use the defense. There you go. Saying that they were abused and that's why they committed the bombing. Right. So now here's the deal. What struck me is very strange about this trial. She claimed over and over again that the boyfriend was abusive, yet she didn't show a single text message. She didn't show a sing. She would have kept one piece of evidence. And again, I'm not I'm not saying that I think she's making it hard and bad for people who actually are victims. And when you see this happening, if we don't call it out. We make it hard for people who are truly victims to come forward. We make it very horrible. But you notice what did happen, though. The prosecution did show text messages that showed that this man probably was a loving dude. So now here's what's here's what's wrong with that, too, though. This gentleman, his reputation is going to be smeared probably for the rest of his life. And if he is innocent and was not abusive to her, he will never find another partner because of what she said, even though. He pre they presented evidence that showed the opposite. Now, here's the other part about that. The defense, I mean, the prosecution may actually, like you were saying, be looked at as a bad guy because now they're attacking someone who claims that they were abused. And she may actually get off because of this. Yeah, I mean, I That's think Belwani is coin toss. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think Belwani is a bad dude. Do I, I, I mean... It, and I think that was brought up. They said a couple times during her trial, things were brought up that were going to go really bad in his trial. So, you know, that's another thing we get to talk about. But, you know, I'm with I'm with Hal a little bit on prosecuting on the facts. You know, I think that is what the prosecution tried to do. I mean, obviously, it was de the defense that brought in um, the emotional stuff, which they had to, you know, but this yeah. is. I mean, sadly, I agree with you, Robert. This is crying wolf for a lot of women, uh, including myself, that have been in abusive relationships. Like, it, it's terrible to me that she is going to discount, if it's not true, what that really is to go through something like that. So, absolutely. Now, I, and I agree with Hal too. Bawini was complicit in the fraud, regardless of any of the emotional stuff. And here's the deal they were Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, they were in it together, <laughs> down with each other until the end. The fact that she is actually doing this, someone should be able to see through this and see how horrible of a person she is. Because, I mean, quite frankly, in the pinky and the brain scheme, she may actually be the brain. <laughs> well, she kind of, I mean, she really was. This was her baby. This was her. And she will say that. She was on the stand talking about how this company was her pride and joy. So. Yeah. Good stuff. This is so fun. Yeah. yeah. I cannot I, wait to hear. I, I can't wait for the verdict. When it comes yeah. out, we might have to do instead of a Friday fraudster, we might have to like interrupt your regularly scheduled programming Ooh. if it works. Seriously. Yes. And do a live. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that would be really cool because, you know, uh, to be frank, this this entire case it disappoints me because, well, on a few different levels. The first thing is it shows you that 
you don't necessarily have to have any real substance behind your products in order to get funded. So that's the first thing it tells me, because when you look at this, she started with an idea. Now, the idea may have been a fairly decent idea. And I do realize that's how most people get uh, seed funding to start their business or to grow their business. So I'm not I'm not poo pooing on that at all. However, as time passed, all you saw the news talking about is how she was the darling of Wall Street, how she was one of the first women to become a billionaire on her own. And she was so great and fantastic because she had invented something that had so much potential and because she was a woman. Never mind if the product worked or not. Then when they found out that certain things may not be what they should be, no one questioned it even further. They compared her to Steve Jobs because she dressed in black and she had this low baritone voice and because she was pretty. Then when it came down time for the trial to happen, they delayed it because of COVID. OK, I get that. Then all of a sudden she showed up pregnant. And let, let's just talk about that for one moment. OK, you know that you're facing trial. You know that there are mechanisms out there that you can put in place to not get pregnant. So if you chose to do that, that showed another sense of bad decision making. If you could possibly spend, be spending the next 10 years in jail and you still decided not to protect yourself. OK, but wait, let's not talk about the fact that she dumped the boyfriend that was supposedly complicit in the crime with her and got another boyfriend just like that. Let's not talk about also the fact that the new boyfriend's father infiltrated the courtroom and pretended to be a reporter. I mean, does no one see how much, um, how bad all of this is and who the real bad guy is? Or are we just going to look at someone who happens to be pretty and just let it slide? You know, what's interesting when you say this is like, you have people like Elon Musk, and I don't like Elon Musk, and I won't be buying a Tesla because I don't like Elon Musk. But he has pushed everything so far forward. Has any company come out and attempted to do this? I don't think so. Right. And it's like, why? Because everyone knows it's not possible right now. So she has, I don't, I maybe I'm wrong about that, but like, she really hasn't pushed it forward. And Okay, Adam McKay is doing the movie with Jennifer Lawrence. And you guys know I love Adam McKay because he did the big short, among other things. But I, you know what? I want him to like, how hard would the due diligence have been to reach out to Siemens or whatever and like follow a Siemens truck as it drove up to, you know, Theranos headquarters? Who, who at Siemens process the order and where did it get sent like this is the due diligence like when in the big short they go down to florida and they're knocking on doors i wanted to see some due diligence where they're like um okay let's sit outside theranos and see what deliveries come like i i don't know am i crazy i want adam mckay to have done to do something crazy like that yeah, and the I problem think, is oh sorry Go ahead, Robert. I was gonna say, the problem is if you do due diligence like that, or if you attempt to, you're called a naysayer. You're called someone who doesn't believe in the company mission, vision, vision, and values. You are demonized and ostracized from the organization. That's what happens to people who investigate frauds. That's what happens to compliance and audit folks all the time. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. And that's why they did the trade secret defense. So that yep. came before the Sven Svengali defense. It was this trade secret. And she used that line over and over again in the media with investors to the point of, you know, if you want me to call out a bully in this case, it was Elizabeth Holmes, who bullied Absolutely. investors, who bullied regulators, who bullied consultants from Walgreens that came in and tried to see the device. It's Walgreens' own fault that their board went ahead with the deal when the consultant quit and they hadn't even seen the device that was supposedly being used. There was so many opportunities. And, you know, I, agree, I fully agree that, like, we could have easily audited and very, very quickly figured out that this was all a scam. Yeah. Um, but I just, I feel like it, you know, they even talk about, you know, the lab was called Normandy. And when the regulators were on site, her and, and Sonny Balwani told nobody to go in or out of the lab. They didn't want right. the regulators to know it existed. So we have to remember that it's things like that 
that fraudsters do to obviously elude us as auditors, as investors doing due diligence. Like, I mean, this, this is signs of fraud, you know, and, and we talk about, you know, we, you know, it's hard for us to, to um, catch things like collusion and those, you know, those things. I mean, they were doing those things. So yes, I think we can victim shame the investors a little bit because they just wanted, it was FOMO, right? Like Kelly says, there's FOMO. They don't want to miss out. They didn't do enough. However, she, I mean, she would, she w- went to great lengths to make sure that they wouldn't know things. I mean, the one guy on the stand, the investor on the stand said, why in the world would I ever have even thought she was blood testing on big machines and not the one she told me? The whole company oh, was about the little machine, you know, I mean, he just, he never even connected the dots that that was a possibility. And so I think, you know, it is determining, like, if you're going to invest in a company, do you need to have expertise in healthcare? Do you need to know what she could possibly be doing fraudulently behind the scenes? I mean, I mean you don't even need that. <laughs> you just need a little bit of common sense. I mean, seriously, because I don't know if you guys remember the one scientist, uh, I can't remember her name. She was a woman in, um, can't remember her name now, but she came out and said, what they're trying to do is literally impossible. The technology yeah. does not exist. Yeah. Now, yeah. no one came forth and said, well, yes, it does exist. Here's some evidence. Nobody. Except and they just the- swept that under the rug. They demonized Except- her is what they did. But, yeah. you have to, but you have to remember that this is all hindsight, that all of this came out in the documentary and in the book. And, all, you know, and there wasn't as much during the, the time that these investors had that we all have now. So, you know, maybe I'm kind of sticking up for them a little bit because I want them to win this trial. I want Elizabeth to go down. Um, But, you know, I think a lot of this we know now because it came out after the fact. Yeah, but if somebody said to me, this technology doesn't exist, like in, in 1989, when I got my first car, if someone had said to me, I'm gonna put a phone in your car and someone else said the technology does not exist, I'd be like, show me, show me, you know, and, and that, that's all it takes. They did, they did demos. They did demos in the off in their board meetings with companies like Safeway. They did demos, but yet the board members never even got their blood results. All they did was take blood and put it in the machine and they never got results. So, you know, right. it was like this, this little bit of what you're saying was happening just enough for it to be enough smoke and mirrors to continue on. Right. But here's the other thing, though. Here's the other thing. Wouldn't you test it yourself? So let's go back to my phone analogy. 1989. Somebody's telling me I can have a phone in my car. Now, if they show me a phone in their car. okay, great. I see the phone in your car. Let me make a telephone call on it. Let me try to call somebody. None of that happened. And then Hal says, what was the depth of the investigation done by the prosecution? Seems shallow to me. But what do I know? I think you're right, Hal. I think it was shallow, but I don't think they had to prove much other than the fact that she was complicit. She knew about it and that she uh, participated in some of the lies that were told. And Shri says, I feel like this would make a great Lifetime movie. There is a movie coming out starring who? Jennifer Gardner or Jennifer Lawrence? Well, what is it? Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. So there so is a movie coming out. Is, like, call up Siemens. How many people at Siemens sell these big ass machines? Like, it's not rocket science and these are but you know what really got me when i was listening to the last episode of carrier's podcast is okay you have henry kissinger calls up his lawyer his lawyer who does you know all sorts of deals for the waltons the devos the blah 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 the lawyer gets freaking greedy himself and he's like begging her can i put in six million dollars and it's just like Talk about conflict of interest. This is supposed to be your legal counsel doing your vetting. And he's so greedy. He wants to get in on it. And I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping the shark here. I am tired of hearing that all these really, really rich people are brilliant because if they were brilliant, they wouldn't have invested this money. They were greedy. Okay. Sorry. Gotta, yeah. Jump the shark. So considering that this trial is just the investors versus Elizabeth, you know, it sounds like you two are kind of torn, probably like the jury is like how much, because this was their defense. A lot of it, right. Was the investors knew what they were getting into. Um, And so, I mean, I think that we've shown just even in this episode, the conflict that they have to be going through in their head right now, honestly. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it all goes back to the fact that there was only one financial person at Theranos and she was only a controller. You know, they never had a CFO. Nobody ever looked at financial statements because would they not see Siemens machine purchases at some point? So, I mean, let's uh, let's just, I don't know, be be investors that will only invest in companies that have auditors and actually get to see audited financial statements, which none of the investors ever did. So that's a whole nother can of worms. All right. So we got a very important topic that we have to discuss here. So Gabe, if you're still here, Gabe said, speaking of rocket science, Tony Stark is a huge fraudulent hero, Team Thanos. Gabe, how could you? Uh, how, I don't know anything about uh, Avengers, so I'm going to struggle with this topic. Now, Gabe also said, sometimes you have to do things yourself, like Thanos said. The Avengers cheated the system, and they will pay for their crimes. So now, Thanos was the bad guy, and Thanos believed in population control, and he wanted half the world to just disappear. And so he made it happen. But I can't believe that Gabe is not on the side of the Avengers who actually righted the wrong. Gabe, we have to talk, my friend, because I'm just wondering why. <laughs> why? Now, and now How could really you be on the side hard. of the bad guy? <laughs> I don't know. I think you two are kind of on the side of the bad guy. <laughs> Who, Kelly and I? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm just giving you a okay. Idea. Okay, can we say this? No. We weren't in the jury or we weren't in the courtroom. Who's voting guilty and who's voting not guilty? Does anyone want to put it in the chat? Mm. Oh, I, I that's... so badly want to vote guilty. I mean, I really, I, I be, only because I think think it, think about what you think about, you bring about. So um, I'm going. She's going to be guilty of something at least, hopefully. So here's the deal. I'll go out on a limb and tell you what I think, and I'll tell you why I think it, too. I think she's guilty. I do think that the investors should have done more due diligence. But the fact that they didn't do enough due diligence still does not mean that still does not underscore the fact that she lied. She lied and she deceived them. They were just not smart enough to trust but verify. So that doesn't. While they were stupid, I will admit that the investors were stupid for not doing due diligence. Greedy. She still deceived them. Guilty. Awesome. It looks like yeah. we're all, uh, <laughs> I know who the Avengers are. Everybody's giving me a hard time now. <laughs> I know who they are. I just don't exactly know the kid, what happened anyway sorry okay just wanted to make sure that was clear. well and you know what we need to keep in perspective about the the investors where is like six million dollars for the attorney who actually you know works maybe he works was probably a big chunk of change but you know what there was like this competition it was like um one family was thinking of putting in 50 million and elizabeth said well the walton family's putting in twice as much and so like you know, you just, it, for them, it's like maybe, I don't know, us buying a hundred shares of Microsoft. It's really, and you know what, you guys, mm -hmm. they've taken it as a tax loss. Maybe. Uh, sure they have. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? I know we're about on time. I, I just thought of this when you were talking, Kelly, you know, that the difference between her and Bernie Madoff that they brought up in trial is that Bernie Madoff uh, profited from what he did. And they said Elizabeth Holmes never did. And and I, I do think mm -hmm. that when we're talking about a, whether we're going to have a guilty verdict here, that is probably also going to be a big consideration. So she never sold her shares when she could have. She never, you know, stepped down as president and took billions and walked away. You know, they really, really uh, hammered that point. So that could really work against us and our all of our guilty verdicts. Now, they did make it a point to say that. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Except for the fact, you know, she was flying private. She had bodyguards. She had so she didn't yeah. pocket the money. But you right. know, talk about living out of the corporate checkbook. You know, like she, yeah. Adam I don't think, like Adam what? Newman and we were, right. Adam Newman yeah. and we were right. Like the same yeah. thing yeah. we talked about. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. That's where yeah. I was about to go with it. And and on top of that, though, she was playing the long game. 
Look at how long Mark Zuckerberg worked in Facebook and didn't sell, sell any shares. And then all of a sudden when it went public. Now, I will say we have uh, Daniela here and she's from Sofia, Bulgaria. And she says, I still can't believe this happened in the U.S. with so, so regulated, with so many regulated medical businesses. Did the regulators change anything based on this case? Because till now we talk about missed controls and audits from the investor side. Now, here's what I will say. They were not in, they were not approved by any federal regulators, not as of yet. So they probably would have failed any inspections or any tests that would have come about anyway. So all of this was money from private investors that they were getting so far to actually develop the product and bring it to market. So they had not gotten approved by any federal regulators as of yet. Can you imagine if Theranos was around during COVID, how much money they would have gotten from the government? Yeah, I mean, truly, really, I think really, they would have gotten just boatloads of money. We should be glad. And I think John Kerry Rue and Bad Blood does make a point to say we should be glad all of this happened pre-COVID. Because you, can you imagine what she'd be developing? And because she switched tactics a couple times. Oh, yeah. With, with um, what was the other? Was it Ebola or something? There was an yes, entire Ebola. Of Ebola. Yeah. And she completely shifted gears. Um, when that happened, um, and, uh, there's a, there's a whole episode about it. So I'll shut up, but check it out. You guys, we could keep talking. Yeah, I forgot about that. But yeah, yeah. we gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do. Well, guys, I think we'll, we'll let Hal take us out. He says her ego was stroked and she was in the limelight and that is how she profited. I firmly believe Great that too. To she it. was, a, yeah, she was a horrible person. Or is a horrible person. Sorry. Oops. So you guys stay tuned for the Elizabeth Holmes trial conclusion. And we will do a special episode. Until next week. Bye.